here back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. I recently celebrated, if celebrated is the right word, and it is, a milestone birthday. And it strikes me that for 50 years now, more really, since I was in high school, so 54 years now, uh, I and many, uh, I have been part of a global movement to try to bring an end to war uh, as a global phenomenon and as an American phenomenon. It doesn't seem as if much has changed along those lines. Uh, it makes one question the progress of human history and even the progress of human evolution to a certain extent because it seems that self-evident that there are, uh, ought to be better systems for managing disputes so other forces might be at work and so for uh, my uh, today's conversation with professor richard wolf i wanted to talk to him about what socialist thought has to say about this constant recurrence of war. And of course, we know that socialist and communist countries have not been immune from it. But as a system of thought, where does war fit in? Why does it constantly recur? Uh, why do we seem incapable here in the United States and perhaps elsewhere as well uh, of learning how to move beyond it? So with that in mind, Richard Wolf, uh, host of Economic Update, a professor at a bunch of places. Uh, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. I'm very glad to be here and very interested in talking about this topic. Well, let's start with this. Um, the uh, global socialist movement if i get my history more or less right i might be off by several decades but you know began to flourish in the mid 19th century which was a time of turmoil rising nationalism the formation of nation states all that stuff uh then uh gave rise to the soviet union during world war one uh we've seen since then world war one world war two Korea, Vietnam, uh, a few other skirmishes I won't mention, Iraq 1, Iraq 2, Afghanistan. Uh, we could go on. Now we have war, uh, if you can call it war, because that implies two parties. We certainly have extreme violence going on in the uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, right now in Palestine. Uh, and it seems to me that we're uh, there must be some conceptual hooks we're missing or some uh, lenses through which we can look at this recurrent problem of war and try to understand it better. Because I don't see, for example, the political discourse in this country having moved one inch in the last 50 years on this subject. Uh, do you have any, th I mean, I know it's an awfully broad topic to throw at you, but do you, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, I think that the, my first thought about it is to sort of confront ourselves with a, a truism that can get lost, even though I think it ought, ought to be the beginning of the conversation. I mean, we have been in a state of nearly perpetual warfare. Many years ago, it was common in the ranks of economists, anyway, to make a distinction when you were talking about historical events between a time of peace, which was considered the norm, which would then be interrupted from time to time by a war, and that you had to make uh, take account of the fact that statistical uh, growth over time or any other series of, of bits of information over time would have to be adjusted to take account of this interruption uh, for a war which changed everything, but you assumed only for a short time, uh, some months or even a few years, and then you'd go back to the normal, and the war was the abnormal. And then uh, a really interesting economist in the middle of the 20th century named Harry Magdoff, a Marxist economist, sat down because he had been a statistician in the Roosevelt government in the 30s, and he did an interesting piece of work. And he took and added up all the years 
across the history of the United States from the time we became an independent nation to whatever it was when he did this work, I think the 1960s. And he did a little calculation of the sort that statisticians do and came up with the arresting insight. Year by year, month by month, the United States throughout its history has been more at war than it has been at peace. If war meant at, at one point or another, somewhere around the globe, your armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, etc., were engaged with an enemy and were shooting at each other in one form or another, then what's normal is warfare. Uh, what's abnormal is the absence of warfare. And I dare say since that time, this is even more true than it was then, you know, because then we were just beginning this business of having hundreds and hundreds of military bases around the world, position our positioning our armed forces so that they can be active at any corner of the globe in a matter of days because of where our ships and planes and and troops are stationed etc 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 that warfare is now built in to our economic system our place in the world and once you once you face that that war has become routinized has become what we used to call the new normal except it isn't new as harry magdoff's work showed so well then you, of course, have to ask the obvious question. Once the shock is over and you realize that the warfare is now built in, you ask yourself the question, why is that? How did that come to be? You might think that it was always the case. That would not be true. On the other hand, for the United States, remember, we are... And boy, is this relevant to today's situation. We are an example of settler colonialism. You know, a number of countries, Netherlands, France, Britain, um, and even others in, in more marginal ways, Spain, Germany, made efforts to develop settler colonies here in the Western Hemisphere. And in the process of doing that, they engaged in what we now call ethnic cleansing. If you look at the early history of the United States, it was at war, as Harry Magdoff's research showed, with the Native American population for more than a century of more or less continuous warfare and flared up at some points flared but was never gone because the native american population was not willing to become slaves so that slaves had to be brought from africa because the native population simply refused to do that and were not eager to give up their land their farms their animals their their sustenance uh and fought back and that must have left a terrible legacy that the whole world is paying for because it accustomed the United States without explicitly facing it to being a perpetual war country. I remember once visiting uh, old Deerfield. It's part of the little town of Deerfield in Western Massachusetts. And it's a remarkable place if you go there, because in old Deerfield, they have maintained the buildings of the main street in the manner that they existed in colonial times. And punctuating, if you walk down the street, it's a bit of a tourist attraction, but if you're interested in colonial America, it's been reconstructed uh, with the original buildings looking the way they did back then and it's punctuated by little signs 
This is what happened here. Uh, this is the kind of work that was done here. Or these are the people who lived there. And what was most striking to me when I visited was the references on the plaques. Here, the savages killed hmm. four colonists. Over there, the savages, uh, that's the word used, the hmm. savages. So notice what's happening here. You come from Europe far away. You arrive here. You push the native people that are here out of their land, out of their access to the fishing or the hunting that they uh, undertook as a way of living. But you deal with them as the threat to you. They are the awful savages who threaten you. The ability of a population that's intruding on folks that have lived there for centuries are able in their minds to reverse the actual relationship. And when you talk to Israelis and Palestinians, you get a similar kind of, whoa. Uh, and I'm not here arguing what's right or what's wrong, so it's a different matter. But the ability to see something in a way that is convenient to who you think you are. You know, as Anais Nin once wrote brilliantly, we don't see the world as it is. We right. see the world as we are. Uh, so, last point. I'm an economist, so when I asked myself the question, why are we a war-obsessed economic system, I look in the economics and there, I'm afraid, it's very easy. Capitalism has two qualities that produce war. And the first one is it's an expanding economy. The only way an enterprise can grow, excuse me, can survive, is if it grows. If it doesn't grow and have more and more profits to use, to buy new machinery, to change your technology, to solve a problem, then you will be outcompeted by the enterprise whose growth did give it the extra profit that enabled it to survive when you couldn't. Therefore, the best strategy, the best aggressive strategy, and the best defensive strategy is to grow, which is why that growth impetus is built in. It's a matter of survival. Well, if the enterprise's survival requires growth, and then the growth it bumps you up against either a competitor or a barrier, such as a frontier to another country, you turn, as capitalists always have, to your government to help you do what you need to survive, which the government will do, because if you collapse as an enterprise, you plunge people into unemployment, you cause a collapse of tax revenue, this threatens the government, so the become, government becomes your ally in the growth imperative. And of course, then it's only a matter of time before you bump against another country with its enterprises, its growth imperative, and then you have the clash that produces World War I and II, as well as many others. But World War I and II are quintessentially capitalist products. All the competing countries at that time were greater or lesser developed capitalist countries. They were economies that had employers and employees organized into enterprises that were growing in order to survive. That was even true in the case of the Second World War, where one of the many countries involved in the war was the Soviet Union, which called itself socialist, but was caught up in a world that was 99% capitalist and not changed in its basic dynamic by the presence of one lonely socialist country. So the reality is that capitalism has produced war. The irony 
Hegel would smile. The irony is that every one of the wars in capitalism has strengthened socialism. In other words, the reaction of people to the war was to become, not all people, of course, but large numbers of them became critical of capitalism as something that had plunged them into a war they didn't want to ever see again. So the explosion of socialism after World War I was spectacular. I mean, before World War I, there were many countries that had no concept of what a socialism would be. After World War I, it was like wildfire. Socialism spread everywhere. And after World War II, let's remember, going into World War II, there was one socialist country, the Soviet Union. Coming out of World War II, there was all of Eastern Europe, the People's Republic of China, uh, shortly thereafter, North Korea, then Vietnam, Cuba in the... Pro Whoa, th this, this is capitalism's great anxiety, and I suspect it's part of our politics today. War is a product of capitalism, and the socialist alternative to capitalism has been able to turn war, horrible as it is, into a stepping stone for a greater appreciation and a greater uh, dispersion across the world of the socialist uh, idea. I don't shy away from the fact that socialists have proved themselves more than willing and able to go to war as well. Russia and China had a kind of war back in the 1960s. And, and war is certainly not something that we didn't see before there was capitalism. So it's not that capitalism is the unique you know, propo proponent of war, but capitalism has produced so far War on a scale, on a frequency, on a horror that no other system, including socialism, has come near. China has no bases around the world. No socialist country has. No socialist country ever did. With all the problems that socialist countries have, and they have many, and they're serious, the predilection to warfare is not a peculiarly uh, socialist event around the world, except in the United States, for example. Seeing the United States Navy and Air Force busily active in the, in the South China Sea today, or busily active at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, that's the United States going to where the warfare either is or might be. We may call all of these behaviors defense, but no one else in the world buys that. That's the American delusion in which it imagines if you call it something else, you've changed it. If you call a bus driver a transportation engineer, he's still a bus driver. We are the ones who are aggressive in these situations. And that has to be faced, even if we don't want to, because that's how the rest of the world feels. And that's why the rest of the world increasingly isolates the United States. And one of the reasons is the military predilection to intervene all over the world. And, you know, actually, Taiwan was one of the reasons why this topic's been on my mind. I had the misfortune of watching the Republican debate recently, but I'm not, I can't single out the Republicans on this one. Both political parties in this country are dead set on, a, you know, no pun intended, maybe, but dead set on stoking this 
Cold War verging on hot with China. It seems to me, you know, I don't want to err on the side of being too generous towards China. You know, I mean, uh, there are certain questions of human rights and so on that are, are troubling. But but it seems to me very provocative that we've been spending billions of dollars amplifying our presence in the South China Sea, that we're, that we're posturing over Taiwan, that Nancy Pelosi goes to Taiwan and, and Nikki Haley talks about... It, 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 and, uh, you know, okay, the Taiwanese should have uh, rights, to, I suppose, to determine, but that's not really the question. The question to me is why we're... Uh, it's almost like an imperative that when there's a crisis in, uh, you know, a terror attack in the in Israel, that our response is to send tens of billions of dollars of weapons, that when there is a threat of a Russian invasion of Ukraine, we ignore the threat. And then when the invasion ta or, or worse, and then when the invasion takes place, send tens of billions of dollars in weapons. And and I don't want to be simplistic about it. I, I, I know that there are many forces at work, psychological, social, economic, and, and so on. But, I, you know, I think of uh, the people who are listening rather than watching will see this. But I found this uh, in my grandparents' things. This is uh, a gold star. This was my grandmother's when my uncle died in World War II. She became what they call a gold star mother. So my great grand, the, uh, my father's family were recent immigrants. On uh, my mother's family, my great grandfather fought in the Civil War. My grandfather fought in World War One and was injured by mustard gas. My uh, uncles and father fought in World War Two, and one of my uncles who was. Uh, a communist student activist at UC Berkeley. I found incredible things in his material. Uh, died in World War II. Uh, and it goes, so it goes on and on. And, and all that goes along with it, the, you know, the supposed honor of being a gold star mother that I, I know my grandmother would have happily foregone if she had, had choice. Uh, the notion, you know, the sort of, I appreciate people who, you know, serve in many ways, but the fact that the president of the United States ends every speech with God bless our troops and not God bless our teachers once in a while. God bless our factory workers once in a while. God bless our health care workers on the front lines just once in a while. That it's, a, this, that, that it's not just a matter of, you know, a form of service. It's a fetishization of military service, it's a, um, uh, it's often the only way out of poverty. If you can survive it, then maybe you can get a GI Bill or, you know, some sort of a college education. Uh, so it's a deeply embedded in our economics and our culture, as you were, as you were alluding to. But it seems to me that we've become uh we have not evolved in our understanding of it as i would have hoped we would over the last 50 years that we're just as bellicose as we always were and 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 i don't know a way to break that i mean i'm i you know i i respect and honor you know my grandmother's loss and the family's loss and would have liked to know that uncle uh he went to fight fascism as we know a lot of people did in world war ii he was brave and you know uh but at the same time uh, you know how do we uh, all right let me put it this way i think there is a human there there is a, a human instinct to be part of something greater to serve to sacrifice to cooperate and these are all things that that true socialism has to offer uh i think that thank you for your service can mean many things and it seems to me that maybe one way out of this is to offer people a chance to become something greater than themselves to work for a greater cause than than themselves without having to go to war to do it. Does that make any sense to you? Absolutely. It makes sense to me. And I don't have much to add. I am the child of, of immigrants in the United States. My father was French. My mother was German. And both of their families, huge numbers of people died 
They died in World War One, and they died again in World War Two. So, I mean, I bear in my psychology all the scars and complicated uh, consequences. Look, if you look at World Wars One and Two, an unbelievable number of people in Russia and China died. Those two countries suffered in those two wars. If not, if they don't rank one and two in suffering, they're right up at the top. Wars were fought across their territory. In addition to military damage, there's all the other kinds, the famines, the lack of water, the, the lack of any kind of medical care, the, the, the need to move great distances without, it's just, it's on and on and on. And people in America don't understand that they've been exempted from this. Even World Wars One and Two were wars over there, not here. With the exception of Pearl Harbor, nothing happened here. You know, you didn't have to run into a bomb shelter. You didn't walk uh, out of your house one day and come back and it was rubble and half your family was buried dead in the rubble and on and on and on. You didn't have these kinds of experiences where they were the norm. My father used to tell me stories that when the bombing started, children would be taken away from the cities and relocated with farmers in the country on the theory that the Airplanes didn't drop bombs where people were scarce. They dropped bombs where people were concentrated, which was true. You know, and so even when he wasn't killed, he was separated at age three or at age nine from his parents, not knowing whether they were dead or alive or you'd ever see them again. Or you, just, you know, you don't need to take an advanced course in psychology to know that you are leaving deep scars and anxieties in a population that we can't do something about it that we made a lame effort after world war one with the league of nations another lame effort after world war ii with the united nations that we are once again in a world in which these institutions literally barely exist nobody pays them any mind you know, there were two votes in the General Assembly over the last few weeks. One vote about ending the embargo of the U.S. against Cuba, and another vote uh, on a ceasefire in Gaza. In On the vote on the ceasefire in Gaza, it was about 125 countries in favor of this uh, ceasefire. 14 countries against it versus 120 whatever and 40 countries abstaining. United States and Israel were among those who were against it. Then there was the vote of the, on the embargo. It was 187 in favor of ending the U.S. embargo against Cuba. Only two countries on earth supported it, and one country abstained. The two countries who, avoid, who voted against ending the embargo on Cuba were the United States and Israel. And the country that abstained was Ukraine. My God, the level of isolation. The whole world looks at what is going on. And this is not sustainable. Adolf Hitler thought he could do whatever he wanted. He was the power. He would shape the future of Europe. And he would bring back the empire of the German people, using the word Reich, which in German means empire. The Deutsche Reich will go. You know, the man was deluded and didn't understand. No, he was isolated. He had an alliance with Mussolini and Franco in Italy and Spain, and, and maybe with the Japanese. And that was it. And that was nowhere near enough as he was shown. The United States is not able to go it alone. Last week, two weeks ago, Janet Yellen was asked about that. And as Secretary of the Treasury announced with great gusto, we can afford two wars. The ignorance about what war is, the ignorance about what war costs human beings, 
Mm. You can't afford one. You can't afford 10% of one. You sure as hell can't afford two of them. This is a mentality. And I know, you know, I told you, Johnny Yellen was a classmate of mine. I know her, a perfectly nice lady. But this is a level of a country's misunderstanding that is usually the prelude for stupefying mistakes, strategic and tactical, because you don't understand you cannot in a you cannot be a country of 325 million on a planet now of, a, of close to 8 billion people and think you can control what goes on. This is lunacy. And the end, in the end, mostly dangerous to the lunatic himself. And I want to end, uh, I agree with everything you've said, and, and thank you for that, but I want to end, if possible, on something of an optimistic note, tying together two things that that w w were touched on in this conversation. One is World War One. You mentioned that after World War, well, after World War Two, there was rise of uh, socialist countries and so on. But I was thinking of World War One. So during the the era of World War One, you not only had the devastation of that war uh, and the loss of American lives here in this country as well, you had the influenza epidemic, and right. you had the one person. It seems to me in public life. Uh, are the most prominent person in public life speaking rationally about that war, Eugene V. Debs, going to prison for it. And yet, for whatever inadequacies, inadequacies we can both point out about FDR's presidency, a lot of Eugene V. Debs' ideas uh, were suddenly, uh, 15 years later or so, uh, becoming government policy, right? So that's one element. Now, we didn't have socialism as such, but we had the pressure of a socialist movement, among other things, and the co contradictions and failures of capitalism forcing the country in that direction. The only other thing I wanted to mention in the context of war was uh, was John Maynard Keynes during the Second World War, what I guess you'd call it a pamphlet or a, a long paper, how to pay for the war. And in it, which I'm sure you understand better than I do, but in it, clearly, you know, some bold ideas uh, because the country recognized the urgency of the situation and that it could not operate under quote unquote conventional economics and meet the challenge. We have a challenge that's even greater now because this is the global equivalent of war in the economy. So putting those two together, I'm hoping that somewhere along the line, these catastrophes will lead us to uh, think in smarter ways, bolder ways. I'm not saying, uh, you know, Galbraith, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that Keynes is the solution, but but uh, in every way, but that we can think more uh, outside the box, as they say, uh, and change things for the better. That's my hope anyway. Am I naive? No, no, I think you're quite right. Let, let, me, let me add, if I can, Another optimistic note, uh, I disagree with some others on the left that um, the go to war uh, is the dependence of the United States economy on the government. I don't disagree that the United States capitalism always depended on the government and does so now uh, probably more than at any other time. And I do understand that an enormous part of what the government does is military. But it doesn't follow from that, and it shouldn't, to believe that it has to be that way. In other words, we don't have to have a war-based economy. We may need the government to support our capitalism. I believe that is already established and could easily be verified. But it doesn't have to be war spending. There are many things the government can take action around that the people of this country need that will put demands on industry, that will require us to have the jobs producing the goods and services we need. Keynesian economics shows that, shows how the government can support 
the economy, including spending on vast numbers of commodities. And those commodities don't have to be guns and missiles and tanks and bullets. They can also be daycare centers, the greening of the population, uh, a whole new program for the aging population to giving them interesting and useful things to do. We, we're a creative people. We have been that. We will be that. We can solve that problem without imagining, as we do so often, that we're uh, surrounded by the savages that are after us. That was a delusion of the people in our colonial time, and that it has survived is not a compliment to our intelligence. And we'll have to leave it there. Uh, but thank you, as always, for uh, a stimulating and enlightening conversation. Again, my guest, Richard Wolf. And as always, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ. And it's amazing that we are able to go into these things and talk freely. It's, by the way, a compliment to the country that we can do it and a compliment to you for making it happen. Well, that uh, thank you so much. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.